Welcome back to Georgia's Fantastic Tavern. I'm Maya Jaggi. With me in Tbilisi are two of Georgia's leading writers who were, who were born in the same year, 1966, and both published their first books in the early 1990s. Akamo Jeladze is the pen name of Gio Akfledjani, a novelist, screenwriter, and literary historian who has written more than two dozen books and won the Saba Prize, Georgia's highest literary award, on several occasions, including for his novel Obole. He has also taught history at Tbilisi State University, worked as a sports journalist, and presented cultural series on, on Georgian TV. Dato Turashvili is a novelist, playwright, and screenwriter with many best selling books, who has also won the Saba Prize on more than one occasion for best play. He studied literature, film, and art history in Tbilisi, London, and Madrid universities, and also translates prose and poetry from Russian, Spanish, and English. Dato was an anti Soviet student leader and also an activist in the Rose Revolution of 2003. He is also a mountaineer and a TV book show host. More information at, at the website georgesfantastictavern.com. Welcome both to the tavern. This is the centenary of the Soviet occupation of Georgia, when the Red Army occupied Tbilisi in 1921 and ended the short-lived Republic of Georgia, founded as we've just seen in 1918. I wondered what does the 25th of February mean to each of you? Could I start with you, Gio? Oh, it's quite plain. It's a simple thing. It's a very sad day in a boyhood when you never know about the story that it was occupation, it was a war, it, it, it was a it was not a long toast in our boyhood, but still in family, <laughs> especially Granny's day. <laughs> they spoke about that. Some quite short sentences they have received, but you know, but uh, despite that, day is of course sad. And day is of course tragic. That's that. That's that because uh, days before even a week, the war started in 10th or 11th of February, January. January. It needed about two weeks for them to come inside because uh, the government left police late night on 24th of government and army and commander in chief who was at the time. He decided to leave the police and restore the front line in Mtscheta, which is old capital, which is about 15 minutes to drive from Tbilisi. But of course, uh, the front was never restored and even prime minister who took a train to Mtscheta. He slept uh, until mm, town of Gori, where he awoke and uh, saw on the station <laughs> the commander in chief who tried to restore and to bring together some souls. So it's a tragic day and I'd say it's always sad when you're losing something which is brought after so many, you know, many people tried to restore Georgian independence during a century and before, because you know, Georgia was independent during even in medieval centuries for it would take two or three centuries and seven centuries we all struggle to restore it. So. So it's the last, one of the last days, one of the last dates you, you can find so sad and tragic for that. And Dato, could I ask you the very same question, what the 25th of February means to you? Yeah, yeah I totally agree with uh, Gio, with Aka, because uh, we didn't know everything uh, about 25th of February, about that time and about that Republic and what, what was happening really in 1921 but it was so tragical day that i remember my my feelings from 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 the childhood uh, i found uh, my first story i think it's my first story and the title of that story is Feb 25th of february without year but because of uh, of 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 uh, of the feelings we had this is really tragical story you know <laughs> uh, and uh, i as i remember 
there was no reason. It was really forbidden to know more about the, the situation, about the, the so-called Mensheviks and what really happened. But we, we could feel it. You know, it's strange, but we, we could feel it, that it was most tragic. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, most, because, you know, parents, for example, we are, you know, friends from the childhood. And I remember his parents and my parents, what, what did, did they talk about, you know, with kids? <laughs> It was not 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 everywhere in, in, in Georgian families where you could talk about the uh, the the independence. You understand, but you know even when they didn't talk about it, we we could understand what did they want to to tell to tell us. You understand? It's strange, but I'm absolutely sure that th that was a strange knowledge without. You know, without the, the publishing, that it, it was forbidden. You know, the, the books about independence, about uh, the, that time, about the first Georgian Republic, was forbidden. You know, we didn't have books. We we could not we could not read about the uh, the independence. But we, you know, it's strange, but it's true. We knew it from the childhood that there was a, uh, the the time three years where we had independent country with the. Uh, the, the parliament with the uh, with the, the own uh, 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 constitution, by the way, and so on and so on. And we lost it. We knew it. And uh, for example, what what's strange? What happened with me uh, in nineteen? I wrote a play about uh, the the title of that play is uh, Republic of Georgia was, and you know it it happens. I think with everyone with the, any author in the world that you know. If you have written something, you know, book or play or something, you 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 don't touch it. You know, it does not exist anymore for you. You know, you think just about new one. And what happened mm. with me with the that play? I wrote the play twenty years later. You understand? So it it was twenty twenty years ago. I wrote it, the first version, and then just five years ago, I wrote the new version because. Because uh, the the propaganda, Soviet propaganda against the Mensheviks and the independence of, of Georgia was huge. Even we had this, you know, this influence of that yeah. propaganda. You understand? That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And in my first version, uh, it was, you know, it was of course my vision, my opinion about them. But twenty years later, I understood that it also I had an influence from the Soviet propaganda. And, and then I wrote a new version. Yeah. <laughs> it's strange what it happened with me because how, then how I did you change uh, it, Stato. I yeah. mean how was it different? I discovered I discovered that it was really brilliant experiment as, as Eric Lee says, because it was the first country state in the world where social democrats could could win in, in, in through the elections. And you know they didn't have enough time for everything, but reforms they they did it. It's really you can be very surprised. Even now, one hundred years later, you know, and they you know the, the constitution. By the way, yesterday was uh, yesterday twenty. So even even now you you know the, that constitution can surprise a lot of people in the world, and I think that. Then I discovered when I, when it was possible to read about, about uh, that independence uh, of Georgia, then I discovered that it was really brilliant, really a new golden age for us because we had, that was end of 19th and the beginning of 20th century. So we, we, we really had brilliant uh, heads and really big stars, not Georgians, international stars, in politicians, scientists, writers, poets, uh, film directors, theater directors, and so on. And, and the Soviets, they, they finished it. So that experiment. So we lost it. We brilliant chance to be very contemporary uh, country. And, you know, uh, the all wishes that generally the people had during many centuries, we could realize in, in that Republic of Georgia. It's true. So I mean, the human rights, the, the women rights, and all rights, and the minorities, and everything, everything, which is you know, 
uh, for what people fought or they are fighting uh, still nowadays. So we had it 100 years ago. So, and then I understood and then I realized that um, we can be very proud because of our past, you know, not only because of wine, Georgian wine, famous and really good, because not only folk music, you know, polyphonic uh, culture and so on, architecture, also for the first Georgian Republic, we, we can be very proud. It happened here, really and, before then in Europe, for example, you know, after the World War II. And people uh, don't know, even in Georgia, they don't know about well, it. That's well, like, you say they don't know in Georgia, but there now is a growing interest. And you perhaps were one of the earlier writers, but the writers I've been speaking to are interested in this period and for, for their fiction, their plays. And also young historians, I think, have become very interested. Yes. In this. Gio, yes. is, that, is that right? That's right. That's right. I have heard and I have read some couple of articles. Young Georgian historians <laughs> visited even British archives and found a, a lot of interesting about that country. But that was really a special country, but you have to know, quite frankly, that that country has no order. There were rebellions, far leftist rebellions, which were covered under some minority problems and so on. For example, Ossetian Abkhazian rebellions at that time, they were communist, they were far left, Bolshevik rebellions, in fact financed and helped by Russian Bolshevik. But that's not a problem for our point of view from this angle we are looking at. This was a wonderful country because it, in a way that it was a very poor country with a lot of problems, but the laws this country has established, they, they were wonderful for minorities, for women, for children, the laws which we are now trying to get. For example, first uh, a woman, parliament, parliament member woman, she was a Georgian. And first have a Muslim woman, member of local, lo local authority was also from Georgia at the time. It's very strange when you have around these guys with guns and rebellions and far leftist ideas. Despite that, that government, the government of that independent Georgia, were not never considered as heroes in Georgia because they were leftists, they were social democrats and uh, uh, not enough patriotic and as Georgians usually <laughs> think so. But, uh, on another way, way uh, they, they wrote and uh, the codes nobody ever had written since that in Georgia, <laughs> you know, when they tried to establish them and to enforce them, that, 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 that was a problem. It was a quite difficult country. It was a country like paradise, which has it, uh, all these human rights. The human rights were written and people tried to enforce them, but the situation around Georgia was always difficult. There, there was a I would say it was an almost permanent war. Ottoman Empire, even Armenians, even Azerbaijanians, and of course Russians fought with them. Inside Georgia, the minorities fought about, against this government. So it was a country with great problems. It was a country with um, such vision of great, I even don't say future. It's about freedom, you know. They, the uh, that people who were in Gamma, they, they understood what freedom was, and uh, that's maybe it's the greatest thing they had understood. The end, of course, was dramatic, and they ran away to Paris, and so on. and 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 and, uh, and the red red the reds arrived here. But anyway. If it, they last longer, it would be much better even for today, for Georgia. Even if they survive 10 years against them, we'd have the uh, thing we, we can relay on today. 
sorry to interrupt Gia. You, you just you both mentioned minorities in yeah. relation to the first public and I just wanted to ask you because yeah. um, when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed then 70 years later in 1990, yes. independence was declared in the name of the first republic. Now I wondered how, how you see that. Yeah, that, that became a problem because the constitution of the republic, uh, that republic uh, that gave the freedoms which were already considered as the old ones. And at that time, eight years ago, they were the per they were perfect for a Prussian in a sense. But and the communists worked there. Uh, there was one rebellion in Abkhazia at the time, as I remember, and the three in Ossetia, because General Ossetia was close to Tbilisi. That's it. Uh, we call it Ossetia, it's not Ossetia. It's the inner Kartli, inner Georgia, we call it. So the restoration of that constitution uh, about the reason, for example, for Russians and others that are, oh, look, 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 there is no autonomy there. But no, uh, no talks about autonomy was in 1821. It was logical because. Dato, would you like to? Yes, uh, so I Maybe think- he, He's more, more political, so he, <laughs> he can say more about that. The child, you know, <laughs> yeah. they, because also maybe I, you know that in 20s, in the beginning, and then in 30s, uh, a lot of the best uh, thinkers, best heads, best really uh, uh, part of the society, they, they, they disappeared or they were sent to Siberia. Can you imagine? And of course, uh, se 70 years later, we were different nation, so-called post-Soviet nation. That's why, of course, that uh, uh, first republic of first republic had so many uh, mistakes. That government, I mean, but also uh, they they were very uh, uh, successful because the the people the politicians were absolutely different. If you see, if you read yes. the, the 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 list of members of that parliament, and 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 the members of Parliament nowadays we have in, in, in Georgia, you know, you can be shocked because there's a huge difference, you know, absolutely. <laughs> there are so many people, they don't know what does it mean to be a member of parliament or what does it mean to be, to think about democracy or about human rights and so on and so on. That's why I think the mistakes you asked Maya, uh, mistakes, they come from, from the Soviet regime, from the Soviet period, from the mentality as a, as a result we exactly, exactly. The Soviet period, you understand? So after the restoration of, of independence and declaration of the independence, again, I mean, the beginning of 90s, we could not understand immediately what was happening. You understand? We, we didn't know what to do, how to make first steps. That's why uh, we had so many mistakes because we didn't know what to do, how to build the, you know, we were born again but without without uh, the knowledge uh, the citizens they have generally. We lost it. We were uh, not citizens of, of, of Georgia or, or, or any country. It was not a, uh, not a uh, state. I mean, the Soviet Union, it was a regime. And you know, to send 70 years in, in, in the Soviet Union, if you, you were not born there or you, you did not spend the, years there, you, 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 you can't understand, but you know, what we have and we had in, in the beginning of 90s, this is a result of that, that Soviet mentality. So we, and uh, we need the time, we need time. Now we, we started to understand uh, why did we make the, those mistakes and now we try not to repeat them. You understand 30 years later, maybe it's too late, but we didn't know what to do that time. That's why we try now to, to, to make right steps as a, as a country, as a society, you know, when we think about the minorities. You know, now we know more. Now we are sure that 
that that the, that always exists a solution. Peaceful, peacefully we can do it. You know, and we didn't know it before, because of because we we are post-Soviet country. Still, we are post-Soviet country. That's the problem number one, I think, in in, in Georgia. The, the mentality problem uh, it comes from uh, from the Soviet time. You, you've both talked about the suppression of the history of the Republic and, and of, of that period, um, and also of, of the, the Soviet mentality still persisting. So I'd like to ask you about the role of literature in both re-examining history and also in, in particularly in re-examining the Soviet period and whether that period has begun to be uh, looked at in literature and, and also in theater, um, and whether those kind of distortions of history have been addressed uh, uh, by, by your own writing and also by, by other writers. Can I ask you, Gio, um, to speak yeah. to that? Yeah, of course. Now, um, now at my age, now, <laughs> I think that um, what I have a, a future left in future <laughs> to live. I have to write as much as I can about Soviet life. I think now like that, I, I, I never had this special such target to writing about as was free, but now I think I have already started. So, but now I think that our new gen generation knows nothing and knows nothing about the life we live there. Not only we or our generation or something like that, but all the older ones, it's, it's a terrible story because uh, I think that what happened with us and what is happening with us now, it has a Great trace back to the traditions and Soviet law and everything that and mentality which was brought uh, after that. So, uh, so I think that uh, we have to write a lot about Soviet thing, about George's life for Georgians. I think I'm not interested in their life because they they, they in Russia, as I guess, and watch TV and so on. They adore Soviet Union. They adore. We have some part of people who say that uh, the life there was well well secured and so on, but still for young people, they have to know that even through fiction, even through nonfiction, you have to write about that a lot. I think that uh, I'm just recollecting now, it was 1985, uh, long before, long, uh, it's two years, but it was long at the times. Soviet Union and Tbilisi, there was uh, uh, the publishing house Merani published uh, anthology of Georgian poets. Uh, it was called uh, uh, 1000 lines of poet like that. And every segment, every author, uh, when uh, the part of the author started there, uh, uh, there was a photocopy, uh, po photocopy of uh, handwriting of that author, some words, short words. Handwriting that was lovely, it was like design. But <laughs> suddenly people found that the, uh, uh, there was a poet like that, Kalau Nadiradze, a Georgian symbolist uh, who survived, absolutely the lone survival guy who, who lived until 80s. All others were short or died early in thirties and so on. And uh, there was his verse on this <laughs> photocopy uh, entitled 1921, 25th of February. <laughs> and it was his uh, handwriting. And uh, the lines we saw there, it, it happened in summer, summer and uh, holiday times. So it was not noticed such, such cleverly. Uh, uh, the snow was falling and Pelisi was green. I'm just translating from Georgian there. And also the Grim Reaper with scythe 
saddled on white horse, <laughs> arrived in, and people were silent. It, it was a, quite a long poem about how, how, how Russians entered Tbilisi. <laughs> and it was a great confusion because how the, this West could pass through all this censorship and so on, but it happened. So all these editors and even painters and designers were removed from, <laughs> from the publishing house, but still, I still have that book. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a while. it's already quite old, but still the things like that happened and the, the feeling of truth, uh, the author was still alive, still alive. And uh, there was a date uh, on, on the, uh, this was 1969, and everybody thought that's not truth. He wrote it in 1922 or 21, something like that. But the kind of truth helped at that time, but today it's a different century. Uh, that things can't, can't move, can't uplift the young people. You, you have to write more wider, more to explain, and so on and so on. That's what I'm speaking about. So it was quite long, but <laughs> I want to say. Well, Dato, your, your, perhaps your most famous novel, certainly internationally, is, is Jean's Generation, um, which was translated by Maya Kersashvili as Flight from the US, USSR, and was based on the true story of seven young Georgians who hijacked, hijacked a Soviet airliner in 1983 to escape to the West. And most of them were executed in a kind of yeah. echo. Of the, of the Stalinist purges in a way. Um, that was written as a stage play originally in 2001. So I wondered what made you feel you had to write about Soviet uh, history that was so recent, but as much for a new generation who didn't know it. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, it's strange that it's very popular this book and uh, it's translated into many languages, but in Georgia, it's strange that, you know, um, nobody know, knows how, how many uh, copies did, did, did they sell because this book has really very many books. Even those, they don't read books generally. You know, I know that from their parents. Even those young people, I mean, they read this book. It's strange because why this book became so <laughs> I don't know. You know, but uh, but I, I remember why did I write it because. Uh, so we didn't know them personally. They 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 were they were older, uh, but yeah, you know, they were older, yeah. older. We didn't know them personally, but from the same uh, neighborhood they were. And and uh, when it happened, it happened 1983. I remember I was thinking so many for so many times about the situation in in that period, about uh, if 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 I knew them, if if I if I was the friend, you know. If I knew what was what was uh, happening, if if I if I decide to 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 decided to join them, you know, that's why I think I wrote the, the book because I had so many questions. That I I thought that the only one solution is to write a book about those guys, you know, to 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 understand what was happening there. Then you know there was a very famous musician, Iraqi Charkuyani, best friend of 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 main main character, Vega. And uh, you know, I was asking everyone, they knew personally them. And, uh, and uh, I understood that, uh, and, and then, then I discovered that it was 45th case. Can you imagine 45th case of hijacking a plane from the Soviet Georgia? We didn't know because the, the, the Soviet Union was very isolated country, you know. We did not, you know, to, even, even to get the information was forbidden and it was impossible. I remember my father, my father, almost every evening listening to the radio, small radio, Soviet radio, uh, uh, and the very noisy radio he had. Nothing, he could understand anything, you know, but he, can you imagine? <laughs> he was so good. He could, before, between the, 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 the noises, he could understand what, what the, the, the man or woman was talking about because it was voice of America or, 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 or freedom from, from Munich. You understand? My father, can you imagine? Because it was the only, only one different uh, 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 
the voice for him for the soul opinion yeah. yeah that's true and and then i discovered it was 45th 45th case to hijack a plane the e interesting that everywhere they they published this book in, in in 15 countries everywhere they changed the title so you know the georgian version is genes generation you know because because of you know what that, what did it mean for georgians for, for Soviet generations, the genes, which was not forbidden, but it was not easy to find. You know, it was my grandmother told me, I asked where to find really American, real American genes. And she said, in Lviv, they have a black market. Can you imagine Lviv? I saw on a map, Lviv, that's Ukraine, was so far from, and she was joking, but it was true. It's not easy. It was very expensive. 400 Soviet rubles, you remember you, 400 American genes. And, and the, the others, for example, German publishers of Dutch publishers, they asked me to write a special chapter, which is not in a, in a, in a Georgia version, a special chap chapter to explain to the foreign readers why the young, famous, nice, and normal people decided to hijack a play to escape from the so you understand they the my Dutch publisher for example he told me it's impossible to 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 understand in, in, in Netherlands what does it mean you can if you want to go to America so why not why why you try to hijack a plane you understand that's why I wrote a special chapter where where I was trying to explain what does it mean what kind of country it was the Soviet Union. So why we uh, always wanted to escape from the Soviet, uh, uh, Soviet uh, regime. And, and uh, I think that this book is an is answer to the, to the regime. By the way, it to the Soviet regime, uh, to, the, to the Russian Empire, because as you mentioned, I wrote a play and, and then I wrote a book, but I did not want to publish this book in Georgia because you know, it's a very tragical story because of, of the, the time was death penalty in, in the Soviet Union, also in, in Soviet Georgia. And I did, not, I did not want to remind again and again uh, about this story. But in 2008, when Russians started bombing also Tbilisi, so I said to my publisher, okay, you can publish it. Because I understood that this was only one, one answer, you know, one reaction or response from, from me as an author to the, to the Russian uh, uh, bombs, you know. I, I didn't know what to do. So I, I, I published that book that says, be careful. So this is the country, the same country. You know, the country, the, the Soviet Union does not exist anymore. And that country has a different name, but they, but, but they can do it the same. They have done in, in the beginning of uh, 20th century, then in uh, 19th They are all the same. <laughs> Nine and 2008, you know, every time, every time I remember we were very young, we were students and parents, you know, they were so afraid. And I remember phrases from my mother and father, be careful because you don't know what they have done in 1956. And I was, you know, it was funny for me. And I, I tried, I was trying to explain that it's not 1956 anymore. This is 80s, end of 20th century. They, they can do it. But they did the same. And then in 2008, you know, my kids also uh, told me that it's different age, it's different uh, uh, century, 21st century. But they did the same in 2008. So that's why I published this this book. I think, I think so. I don't know. You know, <laughs> there are many reasons why we. You write. mentioned. Thank you. I mean, you mentioned the the 19th century. And I did want to ask a little about the history of that relationship, because I think people won't necessarily know, know very much about that empire. But Guillaume, um, your novel of old hearts and swords, it's, it's set in the 19th century and it's a tale of abduction, chivalry, cultural misunderstanding, yeah. um, soon after the Russian annexation of Georgia in 1801. Can you just tell us briefly what kind of colony Georgia was? And do you see the relationship between Russia and Georgia as based on, on a kind of misunderstanding? Oh, it's, 
it's so complicated. Mm. Uh, the Georgian kingdom uh, was taken into Russia with a great lie <laughs> and turned into governance <laughs> after all that so-called friendship. And uh, the whole huge family of Georgian king, the last king, and also his relatives and so on. So they were all taken to Russia. And they lived there until their death. No royal family member arrived in Georgia for 50 years, you can imagine. They were taken, there was some dramatic episode there. Queen shot Russian general, the wounded stopped Russian general uh, because uh, she didn't want to leave her apartment and they were taking him by four. Uh, many, many tragic stories, of course. Uh, when we were younger and we studied uh, our history, how, how we were taught, you should have said that, he, that, that, that there were only two ways for Georgia and uh, two, how to say, negative things, but less negative was to join the Russian Empire. Nobody had joined that <laughs> in general. Nobody had agreed with that, but still it happened so. And another more negative was, of course, Eastern Empires, which we, are, well, we know. which treated Georgia badly and terribly with genocides for the centuries, and we know the names of the empires. But anyway, on another way, it was a new empire, it was a new role, uh, new rule, new laws, totally. Uh, my book is about the uh, first 20, 20, 30 years about it. The Georgians couldn't understand the laws which were enforced and established there in Georgia. Maybe they would no, no better Persian rules because they were longer there. But it's a new young empire who comes with new laws, and uh, the mentality is different. Even the chivalry and even this nobility, they are very different. We know that Georgian nobility came closer to Russians, and what Russia was relayed on it was Georgian nobility, not not, not Georgian peasants, and not common people. Or, Never, never, even for the century, they never trusted Russia to the end, and never trusted Russian law and Russian judge and Russian court and so on. But the nobility it has, you know, all these things on their shoulders. They have to war, they have to get money and jewelry and so on, so on. But there was a huge cultural difference, but by the end of the century, there was some a strange connection. You know, we have a Georgian Georgian and we have Russian Georgian. As it happens usually with empires and their colonies. And it's so difficult to understand because the Russian Empire, of course, damaged Georgia. They say that it made Georgia to survive because Georgia was such by the end of the 18th century, there was a huge Persian attack on Georgia. It was you no know, side that Tbilisi was totally destroyed and burned. Everything, even libraries were burned. Like that is Agamagomet Khan, there was such a <laughs> Persian shock. He died soon after that. But after five, six years, Russians arrived in the the talks which started some 25 years ago at last came to the end and turned Eastern Georgia to governance. But anyway, during the century, Georgia was honest with the Russian empire. Georgia was not such a guy, a swindler, or like that, a con man for the huge and rich country. Georgia served honestly, that's the thing, but when the time came, what Russian surprise, you know, is that uh, wh why do they want independence? 
Uh, they, they are happy with us. They love us. The, uh, the countries like Russia would never understand the feelings of countries like Georgia. We always want independence. <laughs> That's a problem. They can't understand. They think that it's hatred. It's not hatred. We just want to take our way and go. Okay, you helped, you damaged, you did a lot of things. You bring here communists who killed best generation of Georgia in 20s. They usually say that 30s are the Stalin. In Georgia, it started in 20s. It's different, and they never know that. So it's quite complicated, and for us, it's painful. For them, it's a feast, and for us, it's a problem to invite every time man for dinner whom you don't like much <laughs> you know and he enjoys it so wonderful so very great when, I, I, once in airport i i met a georgian sailor who sailed on a, a norway ship and uh, our war was such with the russians the last war which was the uh, 2008 he said who We all understand them. They enjoy us when we uh, run after them with a bottle in hand and they have a glass in there and you just pour and he drinks and he look how, how wonderful you are. That's not a story for us. That's a story for them. That's a story for such a different, different empire and comparing with British empire, comparing with French empire and all other things, so on. It's another story. It's a very, very, very long thing to explain, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they just don't understand or why, why we want to be independent <laughs> far and why all we built all this uh, castle and huge walls on the Caucasian mountain. <laughs> so that's that. And, it's and a that, long, long, long story to say, quite frankly. <laughs> To make you condense such a huge yeah. story into a very yeah, space, but Dato, can I also ask you, um, in relation yeah, to that, about the Georgian language and what the status of Georgian was during the Tsarist Empire? Because the Re First Republic made made a, a point of of language rights, and also what's the relationship between um, the Georgian language and kind, kinds of political protests that you've been involved in. Uh, so uh, you ask about language, you mean? Georgia? Yeah, the, the status of language in the Tsarist Empire and also it, it seems to have been a kind of trigger that when people tried to suppress the Georgian language. Okay. There so were... We were talking about the beginning of 19th century when suddenly Georgians discovered absolutely different, new and strange unusual law in their country because during many centuries we had we had before absolutely different and suddenly and Russian law was was really so cool for them it was unbelievable so they and immediately after the after Georgia became a part of the Soviet, uh, Russian Empire in the beginning of 19th century they started the so-called rebellions everywhere in Georgia everywhere because first of all because the different law and uh, and uh, and what did what did the, they bring? You know, the the the, the Doria family they disappeared. You know, most of them they were sent to Russia. Some of them they disappeared. But and the, the last king had so many kids, uh, twenty three or twenty four. You understand? So <laughs> he changed everything. And what did they bring? Uh, uh, and it was really exceptional. So you know, because of of a crossroad, or, or you know, or, or or this where this, this Georgia is situated. So that's why, because of many reasons, we had so many enemies, you know, huge empires from East, from South, everywhere, from North, from West, and so on. And uh, you mentioned the Ottoman Empire or the Persian Empire and so on. But it was very unusual. Only Russians decided uh, that, that the Georgian language, it was forbidden. It was the first time before we didn't know any enemy like this, like Russian Empire. Suddenly they decided no more Georgian language. You know, you could talk, of course, at, at home or, you know, with the kids somewhere, but officially, officially, everywhere, everywhere was only Russian. And can you imagine uh, any, any institution uh, 
everywhere, only Russian, and you don't understand what's happening. And you, you only, there was, in the beginning of 19th century, there were just three or two Georgians, they knew Russian language. And can you imagine <laughs> something has changed? And, uh, and, and it then, took one century to study Russian for Georgians yeah. <laughs> in common, <laughs> one century. <laughs> it's true. And, uh, that's why, for example, our, our best writers started uh, translating plays because the only, only one solution to hear Georgian language was in a, at the theater, on a stage, from the stage. That's why even Ilya Chavchavadze the best friend of Oliver Wardrobe and, and the, the Marjorie Wardrobe, she translated Shakespeare because into Georgian because he, he knew that in this case, the someone Georgians could hear Georgian language, which was forbidden. In 20th century, by the way, in 1978, we, I remember with Gio, you know, Gio, maybe you remember, we decided to write proclamations, so-called, against the regime, because suddenly they we did were on the We were only, yeah. We were school, <laughs> we were school boys, uh, and yes. suddenly, I remember that lesson, when, when, the, when they closed all doors, you, you could not get out of the, the school building, and we didn't know what was happening. We understood that was happening, something very important, and, 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 and the, 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 the elder, older guys, they told us that on Rustavelli Avenue, there is a, the protest, protesters against the new law. The new law was against the Georgian language. Can you imagine? So what did they have in 19th century? They tried to repeat, to, 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 to do it again in, in yeah. 1978, in, in 20th century. So it's true. So of course we are, you know, we are very, uh, we are, we are a very small country. I mean, only we read and talk uh, and speak this language. And of course, we don't know exactly how many we are, about 4 million, maybe no more. But and we are only one nation in the world who can, who can uh, care about this language or who can, who can survive and who can keep and who can think about it. For us, I, for example, it's a good example uh, there was a really good uh, Russian writer, author, poet, and uh, also novelist, Bulat Okujawa. He was Georgian, but he wrote all his books in Russian. So for us, for them, he's a Russian writer. You understand? So for us, for Georgian authors, to, to be a Georgian writer, it means to write only in Georgian. True. Yeah, because because this is for us very old, unique, and so on and so on. And maybe you know that it's also very strange that we have three different kinds of, of, of alphabet letters. It's also very strange that, uh, so for, for religion texts, we used another letters, for, for novels, another, for Rustaveli used another, and, uh, and so on. So three of them we had, it's really very strange because you know, uh, we are really very rich because there are there are uh, about just fourteen. I'm I'm not sure, but about fourteen independent uh, uh, alphabets in the world. The Georgian is one of them, and we have also three three <laughs> different uh, three scripts now have you yeah, three different oh, scripts. Yeah, I mean. It's also strange. So it's very, very important for us and very important. By the way, in the Soviet period, you have to know that, that Georgia has more rights in culture. So for example, you could perform here in Tbilisi, in, 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 in Georgia, uh, the play which was absolutely forbidden in, in Russia, in Moscow. But it was not Russian's uh, know-how. For example, the same was happening uh, with Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde, uh, they, could, they could perform Oscar Wilde's play in, in Dublin, but not in London. Because that time, Ireland was part of uh, British Empire. So they had more rights in culture, but not independence. So the same was happening with, uh, with Georgia. So it was like, like as, as uh, John Steinbeck, traveled, maybe you know, he wrote a book, 
Russian uh, diaries. I, I don't remember. And there is a very yeah, strange right. case that every Russian's dream, every Russian's dream or wish is to come to Georgia even once in, in, in his or her life. Or, or if, it, if it's not possible while, while he or she is alive, after death, after, because for them, uh, as, as Steinbeck wrote, for Russians, Georgia was something like a, a paradise, you know, because it's true that in the Soviet period, it was, you know, Georgian filmmakers, for example, they made movies, uh, which was impossible to, 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 to make in, in, in Moscow, in Russia, also with the... You had more freedom in Georgia in relation. No, for example, you know, Russians have, they had uh, a Nobel Prize poet, Yosef Brodsky, well known. And for example, he could not publish any poem, any, any poem uh, in, in the Soviet time before his, uh, his uh, uh, you know, he emigrated then to the United States. But it was normal and it was okay. He could come to Georgia and Otar Chiladze, our uh, famous novelist and the poet, translated he could tra his poems into Georgia. And it was possible to, 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 to publish them in Georgia. For example, they had musicians, uh, rock musicians, jazz musicians. They didn't have concerts in, in Russia. It was forbidden. But in Tbilisi, we had rock, even rock festival. You understand? So they could allow more in culture, in uh, uh, other movement, but not independence. You understand? Not political. No, 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 not independent. But of course, they knew. They knew that we are talented people, so they, we are very interested in culture. So they knew what to do, how to, how to, how to stop this movement. You, you understand? How, you know, of course, they could not stop. And every time, as, as Gio said, they don't understand us. Why we, again and again, <laughs> in, in any time, any situation, we need the same and the same, independence and freedom. They don't understand it, but we know that this is the, this is the magic uh, secret of surviving. You know, we need, we're absolutely uh, sure that this is the, the story. This is the adventure of nation. Uh, the, to fight or to looking for, for freedom again and again. This is the secret because in, in other case, we could not survive, I'm absolutely sure, because this was energy. This was the, the, the main energy, main... Uh, uh, Moving force. Yes. yes. Gio, um, Daco started by talking about language there, and I just wanted to ask you quickly about the way that you renewed the Georgian language and literature. Uh, in the, the very early post-Soviet days in the 90s. Uh, your novel, Journey to Karabakh, uh, was at the forefront of that kind of renewal, a fragmented novel oh. about a privileged youth oh, yeah. um, who wanders into the incipient oh. Karabakh war. Now, what sparked yeah. that novel yeah. and what made it new? Oh, uh, a couple of my novels, especially early ones. They are written on a Tbilisi streets land, uh, which was never used. You know, as they were the sort of times in novels and stories, books usually, it was something academic, not used in everyday life, you know. For example, even yesterday, I, I, I with my Producer Fred's were discussing how to develop the story of one Georgian detective novel, where, where, where the speech and dialogues, they are uh, so clumsy, so funny, because, for example, the uh, police officer uh, uh, speaks with his chief and does to him and says, uh, Comrade Colonel, blah, uh, blah, 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 blah. It never happened it in real life. <laughs> They'd say just name or Batono, which means Georgia, Mr. Uh, for example, Batono, George, uh, uh, Comrade Colonel George, they'd never say, but it was written in books. Uh, the language of books was so formal, 
So, you know, that was a problem because every formal document you have to write in Russian. If it passed even, for example, if you write, when you're a student, it writes some, how to say, it, to your dean, for example, on your department. You can write in Georgian, that's okay. But if it's formal and when your dean goes up there to <laughs> rector and up there <laughs> uh, to, 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 to the offices, he, he would write it in Russian, you know. So there was no skill of formal language in Georgia. It was lost. We have great formal language of 18th century because <laughs> it, it may sound funny, but Georgian formal, quite often, many Georgian documents, formal documents written in verse, you can understand it. When the king signs it, he signs this it, uh, through the verse, he tries to, <laughs> like a short poem, <laughs> you know, when he agrees. Uh, the, that was a great culture which was totally lost and also language struggled with that because the formal language pushes it pushes it. When you have to write every single document in Russian, it's finished. Even the professors, even great intellectuals, if you give them this paper to write some simple thing for their, for example, director or head of department in Georgia, they'd be confused because they'd never did that. That's why when I had been reading all these books, I always had a feeling, I, I was a student, I had a feeling, why the hell they are writing this? I didn't understand quite well that it was forbidden. It was not quite allowed that you were writing, for example, some <laughs> not very polite words in your dialect to say, <laughs> say that, but it wasn't allowed. And the dialect should be gentle, so on, so on. And then when I started writing my first book, the only reason was that they to bring that street language to some legal view, for example, um, something like that, you know? And uh, that was, uh, I think that the uh, Georgian speaking language was much rich in Soviet times. When I was a young man, I don't know, uh, even in Stalin times, it was even more terrible because if you see the, the newspapers, Georgian newspapers, the 20s, the language is totally dead and killed. And it's full copy of Russian translation. Right? All these terms and turns, you know, and all this usage of bureaucratic language. And later it turned into, even it was funny, the great writers wrote great novels, but still without using the everyday language. If it's a modern story, you have a, if you're writing something like Marcus, and I understand you have a life. But if it's a modern story, everyday story, why the hell <laughs> you're hiding all these expressions? So I brought it to, to, to my first book and the second book also, because I think I was quite hungry of showing and introducing that. that uh, that's that. Um. I think that that probably is regrettably all we have time for now, but thank you both so much for such a rich discussion of history, politics, literature and language. Um, thank you Akka Mochiladze, um, Ogio Akvladiani and Dato Turashvili. Tomorrow, White so House of Georgia yeah. is streaming um, tavern encounters, um, and I'll be in conversation with Katie Melua about her childhood, her Georgian childhood, and her life as a singer songwriter. And then Becca Adamashvili and Lasha Bugadze are in conversation with Claire Armistead about levity and the limits of satire in the new Georgia.